we'll field questions from people. Um, so anyway, that, that is going on. Uh, we're back to our usual Wednesday night routine. A couple of new classes are starting up, uh, led by, actually you're leading one, how to talk to each other. Yeah, <laughs> which sounds silly, but uh, it's a. Uh, we just started last week. This day and age. Yeah, it is. Yeah, we, yeah. we actually talked about that. No more of that testing sign. Like the first, this, this, staring at you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. No, it's it's um it, the the title of it is uh, divided we stand how to talk politics and religion with people we love. Oh, yes. Yeah, or talking yeah. politics and religion with people we love. It's actually with people we did love. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. That sounds very dangerous. I'm, I'm using uh, a, a, one of my favorite um, writers, is a guy named Jonathan Haidt, and he talks about, he's a moral psychologist slash, so, slash sociologist, and he's done a lot of work in studying political polarization, and so he, uh, did this 25 year long study on the nature of morality and culture and uh, how, we, uh, how we process information and how we respond to things we disagree with. And um, it, I read it about five years ago and changed my life. So we're kind of walking through that. So we just had the first week last week. Last week was the first week? Last week was the first week. This week is the, uh, I think is the most important week, which is where we look at the different uh, foundations of morality, which is the part that is, I think, most interesting, and I think most people will find it mo most interesting. Uh, so that's Wednesday night, so if you're interested. And then the other class is Heather Mustaine is leading on, I always mispronounce this, the Enneagram. Enneagram. It's like a, a personality <laughs> assessment. Yeah. Like, yeah, so think Myers-Briggs personality test, but this is a slightly <laughs> more shock. Oh, it's more, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it was, uh, the Enneagram was designed by Pythagoras, so it has existed since the, that must of the Pythagorean theorem. Okay. Yeah. yeah, those are his two claims to fame. Henry, Jerry? Oh. To, tomorrow night, Council Magoo is having a town hall meeting at the Hamilton Park Methodist Church on the monument. Kevin, you might want to come to see how people talk to each other. <laughs> <laughs> it's at six o'clock at Hamilton Park Elementary on Schroeder. Okay. And so yeah, I saw that he sent me that email and I thought, I need to go to everything he does, but I don't know if I have the courage to go to this. Right. And then I decided that I did. So right. <laughs> it's, it should be it should be interesting, Kevin. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's I'm I'm sorry of being tongue in cheek, but he really is Councilman Magoo, who is Lake Highlands District Ten, is doing it tomorrow night in Hamilton Park. Um, uh, no, Hamilton Park Methodist Church. He's our city council. Yeah, no, I know who he is. Hamilton Park Methodist Church. Methodist Church. Oh, Church. Yeah. Sorry, I, I probably said Elementary because that's where I usually end up. So yeah, sorry. Our uh, Thanksgiving meal uh, is. Not too, in the too distant future. Um, we're doing just one meal. We're doing a lunch, which is right after the 11 o'clock service. So um, they are. different. Yes. Um, and they're going to be. Tickets for that will be available soon. Any other announcements that I have overlooked? Hello. Come on. Yes, I've got. Oh yes, I'm sorry. I thought I'd mention this. Yes, um, that's right. Moana and I give to several different organizations. You know, just for the fun of it, kind of, and for the tax write-off. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, will we? But anyway, um, they send us calendars. Oh wow! Uh, now this is from this is from people that we've given to, and people that wish we would give to. <laughs> I have never gotten so many letters from the starving Jewish children in my, in my whole life. I, who would have thought? Anyway, if you need a calendar for next year, there it is. Thank you. Three, take Thank two, you. whatever you need. No problem. Thanks. They must be able to do that so cheaply because if you ever donate to the Humane Society or the Wild or any of these mm. like this, you know, it's. I've got every animal that's <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've received something from every Indian reservation in Oklahoma. Yes. I mean, no lie, really. There's about a thousand of them. I'm doing that. 
My thank you for bringing those. My mom is so frugal that one day I came home and she was, she had a calendar from like, this was like two years ago. She had a calendar from like 2006 and she was just scratching the number, writing new numbers. She has to get a new calendar. She's like, but this one still works. Yeah. I'm like, I bought my mom a Palm Pilot in the mid 90s and she used it for 20 years. Wow. She's got to stop using too much. Don't work. That's why you have no money, because you use too much dental. Oh, no. That's another story. So I guess let's move to uh, prayer requests, if any. Yes, Jerry. Uh, oh, okay. Well, yeah, I, I mentioned a friend of mine who, um, maybe two Sundays ago, uh, her name's Augusta McBride. And she, we thought she had colon cancer. Mm -hmm. um, she doesn't. She mm -hmm. has a rectal melanoma. It's very rare. Um, so she's, uh, and we're not sure there's a treatment for it. Um, and we don't know where else it is in her body. She had a PET scan late last week, and we don't have the results yet. Or she doesn't have the results yet. But that's different from colon cancer, though. Uh, yeah. It's a cancer, but it's you know usually melanomas grow on the outside of the skin, and they come oh, in and they take them off. But you yeah. can't do that with this because it's internal. Right. It's a very rare thing to occur. She had a melanoma years ago on her on her face that they removed, mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, but. She's apparently contracted no internally. So she's prepared, I think, to do chemo, but um, they're giving her a couple of years. Um, and it, it's not really a real treatment for, for this, so she's being told. So How aggressive is it? I don't know that. Uh, yeah, and it gets in the bloodstream well, and it shows up everywhere. Melanoma, so, the location yeah. it's in, I'm wondering if it's as aggressive as melanomas on the skin. Yeah. So anyway, that's what it is, and she's chasing it. Okay. Augusta McBride. And then Jerry had one. Yeah, um, I know that this time is usually devoted to prayer requests. But I just woke up this morning, and this is the first day that my left knee has not hurt. The right knee wow. hurt. And, and I just want to say what a blessing it is to be in. I don't remember very much about my surgery day, but I do wake up seeing Laura. And I thought, what is she doing here? <laughs> you idiot, she's here for you. And it is just such a, a joy. And thank you. And thank you for the Sunday school lessons and the prayers and everyone that worked hard for food or taking me. I, thank you. I just want to say it's a wonderful, wonderful place to be in. And I'm happy. <laughs> you. You're always free to share those. This is prayers and praises. Yes. Yes. This is definitely a praise. Thank you. Pray. Okay, one praise. My daughter in law had the melanoma removed from her leg. And it, when they went back to do the revision, well, the revision popped open and didn't heal. But it is heat. They thought they'd have to do a skin graft, but it's heat. Mm. Slowly, not there. And we have a member that is a chaplain, her name is uh, Gina Biddle, and she is at Clements Hospital Hospice cha Chaplain, and she was with us when my sister-in-law died, and she is wonderful, and she has cancer of the breast. What's her name again? Gina Biddle, B-I-D-D-L-E. And okay. she is a chap, what is it? She is a chaplain, she's a chaplain, and um, at uh, Clements on the hospice hmm. floor. Mm. She went, yeah, she said, UT Southwestern. She said, I'm walking now with the people. I'm, I can walk and really walk in their steps now, of those that have cancer. But it's early. It's, it's very early. But they're having a little problem deciding on which, when they did the biopsy, they found some more malignant lumps. And so, but they don't have any evidence that it's spread. So you know, she's very upbeat, very, it's, it's just having to have more tests done and more x rays. And so, those are the ones they found in the same area? I actually found it when she, in the, during the surgery. Okay. And the, the type of cancer again is the. It's just breast cancer. Oh, breast cancer. Yeah. And that's your what daughter, daughter's, your daughter's uh, my daughter in law? Daughter in law. Uh huh. And the melanoma. Yeah. No, no. But that was, everything was clean on that. All the edges were clean, so we mm -hmm. 
Uh, your daughter in name again is uh, Ashley. Ashley. <clears throat> Any other prayer requests or praises? Tracy, your mom doing okay? She got yeah, my mom uh, was in the hospital for about a week. She's 83 with a pretty severe urinary tract infection. Mm -hmm. So, but she got to come home yesterday. So, oh, right. so that's a praise. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, Mr. Penny from Houston <clears throat> was here this weekend. We had a great time and all. Uh, he came for a job interview. And just They really want to move here, so we're hoping. Will they flood in? No. What's his brother's name again? You said Penny. Oh, Eddie. <laughs> Eddie and Heidi. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are those your only? Do you have other? No, I have another son, Will. Okay. Will was the one that had the, had the motorcycle. Right. right. Mm -hmm. oh. But he's, <coughs> he's great now. I'm not going to mess with a motorcycle anymore, is he? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and no replacements either. <laughs> 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 um, do, do you have any feedback about, uh, from Sheree Sh uh, Parnell, about? Job no, we haven't heard. I just heard about it. it this, uh, I've, I've, you know, I haven't been uh -huh. in class for a few weeks, and I just heard about it for going. I haven't heard of the interview. Okay. <clears throat> Anyone else? Robert, we're happy you're back safely. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Where did you go? It was in Switzerland. I went to Switzerland. Yeah. Oh, I okay. to uh, with my daughter. My daughter. At and uh, she told me, she said, the first time she had a bed with his daddy. <laughs> <laughs> Is it pretty over there? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, if there are no other requests uh, that people want to share, let's go together in prayer and then Always glad to have yeah. Kevin with us. We're doing first Timothy. First Timothy. The whole thing. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, got bridge. I just do what I'm told. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be praying for you then. Thanks. Okay. All right, let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Lord, we uh, find that another month has uh, appeared on the calendar. Uh, we find that as our days progress and as time moves forward, um, we still find ourselves coming here to gather, to reunite, to find fellowship, and uh, to abide in your love. We give you thanks for a place where we can, can feel the freedom to do this uh, and where we can reconnect with you and learn that we can find you and your spirit and your providence and your love, not just within these walls of this church, but in our daily lives. Please help us to continue to do that. We lift up to you our praises and our prayers, and our concerns for the week. We continue to give you thanks for our brother in Christ, Robert Cone. Thank you for providing him safe passage back from his trip to Switzerland. <coughs> We give you thanks for our sister in Christ, Jerry Baker. Thank you for the blessings that you have bestowed upon her. Uh, thank you for the joy that she feels uh, to be part of this community, to be part of this class. We ask for prayers for our sister in Christ, Augusta McBride, on her recent diagnosis of uh, cancer. Please be with her during this time as she goes through this uh, transition uh, and has to deal with uh, the reality of her diagnosis. Please be with the uh, doctors and medical personnel and her friends and family and provide them encouragement and support during this time. We ask for continuing prayers for Carrie Donaldson's daughter-in-law, Ashley. Um, 
thank you for the blessings that you have bestowed upon her and for being with her during this uh, time of her having health troubles. Uh, thank you for uh, allowing her body to heal on its own without uh, additional procedures being required, such as a skin graft. We ask for prayers for our sister in Christ, Gina Biddle, um, upon her recent diagnosis of, of cancer. Please continue to be with her and help her to continue in her services as chaplain. We ask for continuing prayers for Tracy's mother as she returns uh, home from the hospital after recent infection. Thank you for the life that you have given her and continue to give her and for being uh, such a healthy and positive influence in Tracy's life. We give you thanks for our brother in Christ, Eddie, back house. Uh, please be with him and his family during this time of possible transition, possible uh, new job possible moving to a new city. Uh, please provide them strength and guidance and comfort during this time. Lord, many prayers and praises have been mentioned to, aloud in this room today, but we know and you know that there are others that we keep close to our hearts uh, that we may not want to say out loud. But please help us to know and remember and feel the fact that you know what these prayers are, that you can see into our hearts, and that our prayers have been and will continue to be heard. Please be with Kevin as he guides us through the lesson today, and as we read passages of Scripture, and as we discuss these passages out loud, help us through the entire process to hear not just the words on the page or the words coming out of our mouths, but your word behind it all. A word that we believe was made flesh in your Son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we now pray. Amen. Welcome back. Thank you. It's always nice to be with y'all. Um, so I believe that y'all are starting the next three weeks, y'all are going to be going through probably 1st Timothy, 2nd Timothy, and then Titus, right? Are y'all kind of going straight through uh -huh. that way? Yep. Great. Well, um, that uh, this so y'all are entering a uh, three-week series on what are known as the pastoral epistles. <laughs> and what does epistle mean? Letter. Letter, yeah. Letter. Uh, no, technically not. Um, it is uh, it is considered a part of one of, of Paul's standard epistles, like his epistles to the churches, because he's uh, the past, the difference between Paul's normal epistles and the pastoral epistles is the pastorals are sent to a single recipient, right? Okay. So first and second Timothy are going to Timothy, and then Titus is going to Titus, right? And so um, the rest of the letters, like 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, are going to the church at Thessalonica, the church at Corinth, the church at Rome. And so those letters were intended to be read publicly and out loud. Um, whereas these, uh, and, and actually, um, most of the pastorals were probably still read publicly and out loud because they survived through the history of the church, and so we kind of look at them and say these have some value in teaching, right? Um, they're included in the larger canon of scripture. Um, <clears throat> so the interesting thing about First and Second Timothy and Titus is um, it's a place where you really start to get down to the nitty gritty of, of church life, of the, of the life in the church, in that, in that very particular historical context. <coughs> So um, the the I was reading the the the, the Catholic Church uh, loves and really values this the pastoral epistles because it's where Paul really kind of sets up um, church structure in a sense. So he gives rules about deacons, about bishops, about elders, you know, and all these things. Hey, Kevin. Yes. Um, I brought this up a couple of 
couple Sundays ago on a different <coughs> Yeah. But we had gotten a handout, and, then, and it's it, the handout, and I forget the teacher now, yeah. but um, first and second Timothy and Titus were listed as disputed letters? Yes. Great question. Great question. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> can you so show the, the uh, <laughs> yeah, can can never be sure, right? Yeah. So, so first, second, first and second Timothy and, uh, and Titus, Colossians, Ephesians, are all what are called... Uh, the, the, the lingo that the fancy folks use, uh, deutero-pauline, uh, deutero, which is, uh, comes from the Greek word for second, uh, which is where we get Deuteronomy, right? Uh, which means uh, the deuteronomos, the law, so it's the second law, because uh, it's the second time that Moses, Moses reveals the law to the, goes through the law for the, for the people of Israel. So they're called Deuteropauline because there's this, there is a, uh, in the 19th century, there was a group of scholars who began, as when people started doing more what's called the historical critical method, which means like really looking at the historical context and really digging into the actual language of the, of the Greek text, they started to notice some very strange differences between 1st and 2nd Timothy, the disputed letters, or Deuteropauline, in the Pauline letters. Um, so differences in vocabulary, differences in structure, differences in form, these kind of things. And so, um, which led them to say, it is possible or likely that a student of Paul is the one who wrote these letters down and attributed it to Paul's name, which, was, which sounds very strange to us kind of in the modern era because for us, we call that plagiarism, right? <laughs> so uh, we have a different standard. But in the ancient world, it was very, very common for a student to attribute something they wrote to their teacher as an act of honor. So different from a ghost writer. <clears throat> different from a ghost writer, um, because Paul wouldn't have been like paying this person to write for him, okay. um, which Paul actually does do. He doesn't pay, but people write for Paul a lot because he, you can actually, he actually tells you in his letter... I write this by my own hand. So yes. you can actually see where Paul is actually writing. Um, and and uh, I heard uh, a New Testament scholar a couple weeks ago when I was at my doctoral seminars in Waco, and he was talking about how Paul had um, really, really, really poor eyesight. So when Paul, so he, and he actually connected Paul's poor eyesight to that, that strange place in 2 Corinthians 12 where Paul says, and I had this thorn in my flesh and I begged for God to take it away and God said, um, just kept saying, and, and Christ said to him three times, my grace is sufficient for you, my power, your power, my power is perfected in your weakness. And so scholars have argued for centuries about what he meant by thorn in the flesh. Um, uh, which my favorite theory, I don't think it's true, but I thought one of my favorite theories was uh, that Paul uh, had a really uh, a, a really mean wife and had a really bad relationship <laughs> with his wife. And so when he became, and, and there's actually a lot of scholars who make this case that Paul was married previously because if he was a member of the Sanhedrin, he would have had to have been married. And then when he becomes a follower of Jesus, that his wife couldn't go there with, wouldn't go there with him, and they ended up breaking up. And so Paul is um, now single. This is this is one mini theory. So Paul is single, and so his thorn in the flesh is his, you know, previous relationship with his now ex-spouse. Um, which I just thought that what that makes Paul such a colorful character, you know, for us. When I mean, we think of Paul as this kind of monkish, celibate person, but like you know, that that's a Christian history thing to, to take take vows of celibacy. I mean, it was kind of common. I mean, Jesus did. There were some rabbis that did that kind of thing. But really, uh, if you're a member of the Sanhedrin, you had to be married. I mean, that was part of the rules. So anyway, but Ben Witherington, this guy I was listening to the other day, he makes the case that it was Paul's eyesight was his thorn in his flesh. He had poor eyesight. And as someone who has the worst eyesight in the world, I wear contacts, but if I had my glasses on, they're about this thick. Um, I, I thought, okay, there you go. A little, little, little uh, you know, connection there with Paul. I think the eyesight might make more sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and if you think about writing, if you, if you, 
I mean, in a world without corrective lenses, you know, especially as Paul's getting older, um, you know, he would have to have people that are writing for him, right? And so, and I mean, I have no idea how many hundreds or even thousands of letters Paul probably wrote, and all we get is this little collection of them, which is really interesting. You know, there's um, a lot of scholars think that there is actually a third letter to the Corinthians. Um, and it, well, and there's we have some pieces of a third letter to the Corinthians, but it just got lost to history, you know. But they took forever to write because they were using scrolls. Oh yeah. I mean, they didn't have all like computers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, um, <laughs> I read what Larry, Larry Hurtado says <laughs> that it would have taken a skilled and trained scribe. Um, eight and a half hours to transcribe one copy of the letter to the Romans. Wow. Which, I mean, that's more than a full work day. And a transcribe could only write for four hours at a time and then had to take a break. So, I mean, if you're thinking about the transmission of the text, I mean, this is a lot of work to get to pass these things along. <clears throat> um, so, you know, and, and so, I mean, you know, we're in the month of celebrating, I think today, oh no, is it the first? 29th. Month? The first today. The, the o October 31st, oh, is, that 31st? Is, uh, is the celebration mm -hmm. of, of uh, Martin Luther nailing the 95 Theses yeah, on the door of Pittsburgh, right. um, which would have been a completely ignored historical event had it not been for an invention called the printing press mm -hmm. that Johann Gutenberg had just designed. Mm -hmm. um, so Luther's little pamphlet <laughs> that he wanted to spark a debate in his own hometown about abuses in the church his students took it, gave, took it to a printing press, printed it, and it spread all over Europe, and the world was never the same. You know, um, so the transmission of these texts is very, very uh, complicated. I mean, it takes time. So anyway, so I, I'm glad you asked that question, Ken. I, I wrestle with that because this is one of those letters where <clears throat> there's things that are said in this letter that are deeply troubling to me. So, for instance, um, I'll just give you a, a good for instance here on, uh, in, in chapter 2, uh, verse 8. Okay, he's talking about uh, prayer, first of all. Which, this isn't that troubling. This is like, okay, but it, start, it gets more and more and more as it goes on. I desire then that every place men should pray, lifting up holy, this is verse 8, sorry. Lifting up holy hands without anger or argument. Okay. Pray with your hands up. That was very traditional for Jewish men. You pray with your hands out, right? Like, that's more Pentecostally now. We don't really do that, but okay, whatever. <laughs> also, that women should dress themselves modestly and decently in suitable clothing, uh, not with their hair braided, gold pearls, or expensive clothes. It feels a little micromanaging to tell women how to dress, but you know, okay, like we can all appreciate modesty. Well, that's yeah, yeah. I know a lot of people, don't you know? And then it starts. <laughs> yeah. And then it starts getting, around more. Yeah, and, and we and we know how the pendulum swings on that kind of thing, right? So then it starts getting this th to this. Let a woman learn in silence with full submission. I permit no woman to teach or have authority over a man. She is to keep silent. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived. Actually, Adam was deceived by the woman and became a transgressor transgressor and she will be saved through childbearing provided they continue in faith and love and holiness and honesty. That is a really there are a lot of reasons why that text is really troubling. Um, not to mention the fact that um, women's value seems to be distilled down to whether or not they can have children. Um, but the fact that in 1 Corinthians Paul says that when a woman gets up to prophesy, preach, Share the word of God, make sure our head's covered. So he's already told us in an undisputed letter, like we absolutely know that Paul wrote the Corinthian letters. He told us that a woman should, uh, when, when a woman preaches, cover her head. The reason why they cover their head is because, and, and my professor, at this comes from a Baylor professor, so you know this isn't some crazy off the wall thing, right? So, <laughs> so Dr. Hong, he's Danish, he's very, he's very good. He said that uh, in that culture, and, and um, <clears throat> very common in cultures today, right, women wear a head covering, right, when they're in public. And when a woman takes off her head covering, she only does so in the presence of equals. Mm -hmm. So either her spouse or 
people that are of her same class. So for a woman to remove her head covering in the ancient world, or even today in the Middle East, to, for a woman to remove her head cover, it signifies to everybody else that is below her on the socioeconomic ladder, you don't belong here anymore. So get out. And when you're doing church in a house, and everybody is the family of God, and everybody is the household of God, as Paul says a lot, well, the way to say that this is a public space is to continue to wear your public clothes. If we were meeting for a Bible study in my house and I walked out in my boxers and t-shirt, you'd probably be like, it's time to go. Kevin's like ready for bed. Like, oh, sorry, we didn't realize, you know. Um, one of the sociology professors at Baylor, he was telling the story, he was teaching a class on, uh, on morality and space and how we... Um, we do certain things in certain spaces that signify to others that this this space is for this purpose, right? So he, in class, he was talking, and as he was teaching, he started slowly taking off his clothes. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, Where by the time this? he started unbuttoning the top button, is this at Baylor? See, this was at Baylor. And he said, he said he could see some of the, you know, little, like, sweet Baptist like you know, eighteen-year-olds like their eyes starting to get bigger. <laughs> and then, and then he he had basketball shorts underneath oh, his okay. pants on. He had workout clo clothes on underneath his clothes. But then, by the time he dropped off his clothes, like he said, people went ah, and they closed their eyes <laughs> because you know. And, and he said, if you saw me walking through the gym wearing this, you would think nothing of it because this outfit belongs in this space, right? But what belongs in the space of the classroom is I wear a tie and I wear slacks and I wear, you know, that kind of thing. And so when Paul says women need to cover their head when they're preaching, the, the purpose of that is to say that this is now a public space. This is not just my home anymore. This is, this is where our church meets for worship, to worship the living God, right? And so <clears throat> the difference between public spaces and private spaces um, so often... Uh, it, it's nothing intrinsic to the space itself. It's the way that we treat it, right? Um, we, we walk differently and act differently and breathe differently in the sanctuary than we might in a movie theater. But we're all still sitting in chairs pointing at something, watching something, right? There's something different about that space. But it's still just a space. But it's never just a space, right? I mean, so that's the weird, that's the, I think, the beautiful paradox of that kind of thing. You know, my... Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, verse 11, my Bible spun that positively. Interesting. Um, because, Tell me what it says. Well, well because it, it said that in, in that day, um, women were not allowed to learn. Women were not allowed to study. Um, they were, and, and so the fact that, that it says uh, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission is acknowledging that women are allowed to learn. Um, and because in those days, at least that's what it says. In those yeah, days, and I, I have to believe that's probably true. Uh, and th and that is such a that is such a great take on that on that verse. I think uh, so. And and the, the the kind of the point I'm going to is it's just that is <clears throat> we have a tendency to read these letters <coughs> with with a with a pair of glasses that were forged in. Our own modern worldview, forged in the, enlight the European Enlightenment, uh, forged by our race, our socioeconomic class, by our gender. I mean, all of these things that shape the way that we read the text. And so, in a in a post women's suffrage world, which was really just like a hundred years ago, by the way, y'all, that was not that long yes, ago. Um, you read something like that, and you think, what a what a restrictive. Uh, terrible, misogynistic text. But 1900 years ago, when women were only property and only had value if they could make children for their husband, that's a pretty liberative text because you're saying women have the right to learn. And so it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough tension to balance. But I think it, it's really, and my brother is a history professor, and he, he always says, uh, we, we have a tendency to judge history by our own standards. Yeah. Um, but we would not be where we were if it weren't for them. So, but that does mean that we continue to learn from those, 
from those stories and learn the things that are good and bad. But if, if this was meant to liberate them, either it tips the first domino and there are other dominoes that will fall behind it, or no, this is once and for all, for all time, and we just overshot it. And, and I, but it's not clear. And that's it's, our, yeah. It, it's not internally clear. Yeah. And that's why, that's such a great point, Travis. And that's what, and that's what's so sad. And that's what's interesting. Like, what, who did I say uh, at the beginning loves these three books? The Catholic Church. <laughs> Which I'm a big Catholic apologist. I love Catholics, blah, blah, blah. All good things, right? Qualify, qualify, all the things. And, and this is the stuff that if you're, if you're not reading this, culture with any kind of sense of cultural context mm -hmm. you read this and you think okay this is just the word from here on out you know and there was actually a group in my undergrad uh, a, a little group of, of people who would study the Bible in the library together they were like they're a little they were a little culty and the, and the girls this is like in 2002 the girls would wear head coverings oh. and would sit in silence in the library and I heard Simmons and Emily like <laughs> What? <laughs> it's in Saudi Arabia. Like, what are you doing? But they read this, and they read it literally. And they thought, this is what Paul says, so this is what, how it has to be for the rest of life. Fine. Oh, uh, that was one of the, that, uh, uh, in chapter 2, that verse 15, was one of the questions that I had about that women being saved through childbirth, mm -hmm. which I, uh, that's not right, but anyway, we'll go on. Um, the next one, the first one I had was in chapter 1. The last verse of that chapter, among them are that Hythensia, or whatever that guy's name is, and then Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. Mm. Now, what, huh? <laughs> Where, that, where's, where's that? Uh, where's that uh, one or twenty. One twenty. In the. Uh, oh, yeah. this is this is in the what the heck is this? New International Version, which could be completely misconstrued. Um, no, no, you're right. So. So, I hand it over to be taught not to blaspheme. Yeah. Satan's going to teach them not to blaspheme. Satan's going to do what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a strange book. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so let, let's, to, to answer that, which I think is really, um, uh, I might be let's go. here. So no, I'm no, sorry, it's sorry. great. And, and so, well, we'll just talk about that for like one second. So, in the early church, they had a concept, they had a way of understanding church discipline in a very different way than we do now. And so, when someone <clears throat> violates the rules of the community, and, and by violates the rules of the community, I don't mean that they were caught dancing on Friday night. I mean like, which is very Baptist. Right? <laughs> um, that's an example of a Baptist moral that we you know. Um, but that, uh, I mean, as it talks, as Paul talks about First First Corinthians, um, there's a member of the church who, uh, she, who was probably kind of a, a young bride. So there's a, a guy that was a member, there's a guy that's a member of the church who's a lot older. His wife, what we, what we think happens is his wife probably died, and then he probably remarried a younger woman. Well, he's got a son from a previous marriage who's probably about the the age of this woman, and so his son and his new wife have began a sexual relationship. And so Paul, I mean, this is First Corinthians, I think, 6. <laughs> These are all the elements of a great soap opera. Yeah, really? I mean, I'm telling you. So, let's see. Uh, verse, uh, oh no, sorry, uh, First Corinthians 5. It says, it is actually reported among you that there is sexual immorality among you, even the kind that is not even found among the pagans, because Romans had laws against incest. So this is actually... What's happening in the church actually violates Roman law, not even like Christian wow. law or whatever. <clears throat> um, for a man is living with his father's wife, and you are arrogant, so you should not rather mourn. So should you should you not rather mourn? Should you not rather have mourned? Sorry, should you not rather have mourned so that he was so that he who has done this would have been removed from among you? Um, so he talks. Oh, here you go. For those who are absent the body and present in the spirit, as I present, I've already pronounced judgment in the name of the Lord Jesus on the man who has done such a thing, right? Having sexual relations with his mother-in-law, or his stepmother. <laughs> when you are assembled and my spirit is present with you in the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, you are to hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. So that's another place where you hear that language. 
And so when the church thought of when you expelled somebody from the community because of something like this, right? Like this guy's having sleeping with his stepmom, which is even an illegal action among the Romans. So if some Roman comes by, hears what's happening in the church, and you go, y'all do that? Woo, man, that, you Christians are dirty. Like, that destroys the witness of the community, right? Mm -hmm. So Paul says, you have to turn this man over to, as he says, to Satan. Just turn, turn him outside of the church, right. and then the hope is that he'll <coughs> change his ways and come back, right? And likewise, uh, when he says, turn, turn them over to Satan so that they may not blaspheme. Um, it, it's a phrase that I think we can think of, of kind of euphemistically as to kick someone out of the church, but Paul believes that you're casting someone out of the community. In, in this world, like, what did the early church do together? Well, they prayed, they broke bread, they shared everything. This says they were a family it, of faith. This says that if the church was considered a sanctuary for <coughs> Satan's power. Just say that again? That the church was a sanctuary from Satan's power. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, and, and if you think about the world that they live in, the second you walk out of the doors of that house, church that you're meeting in, there's idols everywhere, there's blood sacrifices everywhere, there's brothels everywhere, there's... I mean, there's, I mean, you know, we, we use the phrase rape and pillage when we talk about Vikings and Romans and stuff. Mm -hmm. We don't mean that euphemistically. They raped and pillaged. Like, they just, they were violent, violent people. And if you live in a world where, like, that's the government that you're a part of, that's a part of the, um, and all, everything in the world is saturated in that, the church becomes the only safe place. Mm -hmm. And it becomes the only place where, as, as you see in Acts 2 and 4, it's the only place where everyone has what they need, everyone is cared for, everyone is valued. Widows and orphans are treated as a part of the, the community. Even slaves have a place to belong in the church. And so it's easy for us to, I think, read back and criticize Paul for not being more, you know, you should have been more progressive on, you know, women's rights and, and race reconciliation and all these things. One, like, our concept of race was created by white supremacists in the 1700s. That wasn't created, like, that didn't exist in Paul's world, right? Their distinctions are Jew and Gentile, right, and country, and country, uh, country connection. So <clears throat> it's easy for us to judge Paul, I think, in hindsight, um, but what, and one of the scholars, James Dunn, that I was, I was reading, that I, I used to, to, to study for this, he talks about how um, these texts are so shaped culturally. So when you read the parts in here that are kind of, that are odd, <coughs> if odd to offensive, there are corollaries in common philosophy that you would have heard in those days, right? So the Romans had a, in the Greco-Roman world, there was a very traditional family structure, right? <clears throat> Women were the property of men, and in the household you had the man, the woman, the children, slaves, right? And so the fact that Paul speaks to and gives value to any of these other people in the community is pretty radical unto itself. And so the fact that you have, um, so one, like I love the way you're, you're your version puts a kin of like the fact that women are even being allowed to learn is a huge step forward. Um, it doesn't feel like a huge step forward now, but remember we're only a century away from a time when women couldn't vote. And it was just last week in Saudi Arabia that women were given the right to drive. Right. Wow. <laughs> right? So we like to think that we're these like super progressive, thoughtful, moving forward, so so educated and cultural and all these things. But like we're <laughs> we're moving along at a very slow clip <laughs> throughout history, right? Um, I don't think so. No, you still. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, you go to they're giving them, and it may not be Saudi Arabia, but a country has given the women the right to not wear the hijab. Yeah. 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 yeah, so the heart of this the heart of this book though, since we're kind of running out of time, but this this was really fascinating conversation. Um, thank you all. Um, and this is kind of a book where like you kind of gotta pull stuff out that you like, what on earth is this about? You know, to, to grasp something. So 
the, the point of this letter, if we're going to have one kind of overarching theme, is this is about how to live in community together. And in the ancient world, um, your community was either your house, your actual family, your blood connections, and oftentimes, especially among Romans, uh, those family connections became uh, turf for <coughs> clan warfare, which obviously continues on throughout history, and we still have that. You still have that kind of thing today, right? Um, but in the church, Paul Paul embraces this new language of of the household of faith, of the family of faith, to show us that our connections are not just through our actual DNA, genetic blood, but through the blood of Jesus who's united us all through the resurrection. And so it is, it is in the death and resurrection of Jesus that the walls that separated us previously have now been torn down. And so now, in this because of the cross, we are able to live in this community and we're trying to reflect the beauty of the new creation. And so... When Paul, in the, in, especially in the Undisputeds, for one, but Paul spends so much of his writing time in the New Testament trying to, trying to get it through our thick skulls <laughs> that, we have been, that we have been saved by grace and we've been liberated from the law. And he even says here, uh, <clears throat> he says, so in, in chapter 1, uh, verse 3, so he's, so 1, before I read this, He's dealing with a group of folks called the Gnostics. Gnostics. Um, you've probably heard that term because it's kind of been popularized lately, which comes from this Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. And so the Gnostics were famous for being very uh, private and secretive and very... Um, uh, if you go and like, you can go online and you can read and stuff like uh, the Thunder Perfect Mind was like a famous Gnostic writing, and it just sounds very like weird and mysterious. And and so their whole thing was like, um, we have the secret knowledge, and if you don't come in and get a part of our group, you won't have the secret knowledge. And so there was this, so they created these very strange doctrines around Christian faith, and Paul kept saying over and over again, you don't need all these Christian, you don't need all these doctrines. What you need is the cross. And so as he says in 1 Corinthians, I came to you and I chose to preach only Christ and him crucified. That is the, that is the gospel. The gospel is that Christ, through, through his death, sacrifice on the cross, has liberated us from the powers of sin, from death, from all of the things that divide us from each other, all the things that uh, shackle us down. And so when we... As we, and, and he was very careful also to try to not give us a new moral code because we love rules, right? Like rules are so easy. Like Ten Commandments, really easy. Like don't do these ten things, right? But he says, but he tries to get us past an understanding of the law where the law is just, um, where the law is the fence around us but recognizing where the law is, and Paul uses this term when he talks about the law. He says, the, Paul, the, the law was our pedagogos, or, which uh, is a nice Greek word that means nanny. <laughs> Peda, like pedi pediatrics, like child, and gygos, like, like pedagogy, y'all know that word, right? So your, pedag your pedagogos was your nanny, it was your teacher. And so he talks about the law, meaning like the Old Testament law, like all the rules and regulations in Torah, and he uses this term, he says, it was our teacher, it was our nanny. But at some point when you grow up, do you need a nanny anymore? No, at some point, the rules that your parents teach you, that your nanny teaches you, they sink down into your bones and they become virtue. And you don't need to go, oh gosh, what do I do in this moral situation? You just know, like you have a moral compass. And that, and that is the spirit of the living God that Paul talks about, how we are the... We're the temple of the Holy Spirit together. And so we continue. And so the, these letters, you'll, you'll hear this kind of in this letter right here. So he's trying to speak to a group of Christians who are being slowly swayed away 
by these other teachers who are saying, no, no, it's not that easy. There's all this other stuff that you need to know. And it's only secret knowledge that I have, right? I had a bunch of Jehovah's Witnesses come to my house the other day, and I was like, I, no, no. <laughs> it's all, all that stuff is unnecessary. The 144,000 people only going to be saved, all that stuff, like, none of that's real. Like, you're making it way more complicated than it needs to be. They didn't know what they were getting. Right. <laughs> so, so Paul, Paul, Paul says, or, or so the, the, the te uh, the letter reads this way. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God, our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, our hope. To Timothy, my loyal child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Travis, would you read three read three through four, three and four? Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, chapter one, three and four. And we're gonna we're gonna wrap up here really quick, I promise. We're gonna get in and out really quick. I urge you as I did when I was on my way to Macedonia to remain in Ephesus so that you may instruct certain people not to teach any different doctrine and not to occupy themselves with myths and endless genealogies that promote speculations rather than the divine teaching that is known by the faith. You just like think the kids, people that speculate, myths, endless genealogies, things that don't actually lead to divine training, things that don't actually build you up. What good is it to think that only 144,000 people are going to save, right? That's like a Jehovah's Witness thing. It doesn't really help, because then you go, that's not many people. There's like seven and a half billion people on the planet. I'm probably not better than at least, you know, <laughs> half of them, so why even try, right? So like these endless speculations, and that's what Paul is dealing with, these people who are trying to make faith so much harder than it needs to be. Because if you're the teacher and you're telling your students this is how hard it is, that's a one, that's a power move. <laughs> so um, Two, Paul keeps saying over and over and over again, no, we have each other, we have the Holy Spirit in us to help us live in this new creation. So, uh, let's, yeah, somebody read uh, 5, uh, 6, and 7. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Some have departed from these and have turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they are talking about or what they so confidently affirm. Is that where you want me to stop? Yeah, that's great. And actually read verse 8. Uh, we know that the law is good if one uses it properly. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's one, I love that Paul exists always in this tension between law and grace, mm -hmm. law and spirit. So he's never saying, you don't need the law anymore, because he keeps saying, no, it's a good teacher. But what he's saying, but then on the side of the Spirit, he's saying, but we have been set free from the condemnation of the law. The law has, still has something to teach us. Paul never gave up on his Jewishness. But his Jewishness got so much bigger. His understanding of God's amazing grace became so much bigger. But it's not like Paul really ever quit being Jewish. He was culturally Jewish. So, I mean, he, he breaks bread with Gentiles. He might have eaten a little pork, which I bet was pretty uncomfortable for him when he first started doing these things. Like, oh, I'm really not supposed to do these things, but I have this deep theological conviction that God doesn't really care that much about these trivial matters that we keep putting on ourselves, right? God doesn't really care... Uh, exactly how you take communion. Should we have little cups or one cup? I don't know. What should we do? You know, like, it, 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 so much of it is the, the context in which you live, the, the, the communities that the communities that we gather into, right? Like, when we did communion with my youth, um, we always did a single cup. Um, not for any theological reason, because it's just easier to pour a single cup and share it with, with 40 youth than it is to try to do all the little cups, right? Um, what matters is the, the, the way that we understand those moments and the way that the Spirit intercedes in our hearts and in our lives together as a community. And so in Paul's world, there were some very restrictive and strange to us cultural assumptions about how women were to act, how men were to be, and how the world was put together. And Paul continually enters into that world and says something like, sure, wives submit to your husbands, but husbands love your wives. It would have been a very, like, wives submit to your husbands, you can kind of picture all the husbands stand up and go, yeah, wives submit to your husbands, <laughs> but husbands love your wives. Oh, okay. 
I have a responsibility now. And so Paul is always flipping the script on us in whatever case, whatever the case may be. And so while we have a tendency of wanting to read this, and I love the way he said that, and just read it as this for all time throughout eternity, rather than recognizing that this is speaking into a very particular 